Alright, hello, welcome, bienvenue, konnichiwa, ni hao, jambo, morhaba, it's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again, episode 197 on Sunday the 29th of August, I'm Armish Phil, I'm Armish Ben, I'm Armish Matt, and tonight we've got Peter McCoy here from michaellogos.world, how are we doing Pete? Doing great, doing great. Good to have you here, it's an interesting subject which is, has been gaining traction over the last um Two or three years, in particularly, um, this this issue of uh, mycology, mycelium networks, and all the rest of it. Um, what is it about mushrooms? Do you think that makes them such a special, unique uh, organism? Is that the right word? Yeah. Well, oh, well, they're a branch on the tree of life, so they're they're their own kingdom, or myself and many others like to call it a queendom. Um, <laughs> so, alongside plants and animals, bacteria. Uh, archaea we have fungi so they're a huge group roughly two million species thereabouts we think so lots of them and most of them unnamed so that's kind of broadly what fungi are and get more into detail but what's the appeal um i mean for me there's tons of appeal that's why i got hooked when i was a teenager and kind of haven't given up the ghost you know going on 20 years um because really they're interesting on many fronts and endlessly fascinating and eternally mysterious. Um, they're one of our least studied aspects, least understood aspects of the natural world. And as we've only started to unravel in just the last handful of decades with kind of better technology and more people looking around, uh, we're finding that they do a ton, 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 ton for the environment. Um, they kind of underlie all natural cycles and, and heavily influence many of them uh, in significant and unique ways. And then we're also really at this crux of human history where we're learning to cultivate them easier and apply them into the ways we live our lives and design you know, our societies, our homes, clothing, fabric, food, medicine, um, and bringing fungi greater into focus in those processes and finding new applications, great benefit, health benefits, environmental benefits, um, all kinds of things. So it's just, it's an emerging and exploding science that was for very long neglected and one of the sort of the least least looked at natural sciences in many respects, and really kind of one of our biggest gaps in understanding the world. And as you know, the scientists have sort of figured that out more and more recently and been able to speak louder thanks to the internet, and then the amateurs and the uh, people sort of seen around the curve with it, kind of getting a little traction, more and more you get people a little bit more in the mainstream and whatnot. Um, and of course, with more movies and what, uh, what have you kind of bringing attention to it all, uh, all the benefits, all the excitement, all the interesting aspects of fungi you can talk about till, you know, the end of time um, are resonating with more and more people. And so, yeah, I mean, we can go any direction with that. I mean, there's, I'm interested in all of mycology, you know, from the, the, the nitty gritty of the biology and the physiology and how mycelium grows, which is really weird and interesting and unusual um, to their effects on human history and cultural development to their applications for making the world more sustainable and, and us, uh, you know, reducing our impacts through pollution and things like that. What, why do you think they've been sort of neglected for so long? Did did scientists back in the day just sort of write them off as like similar to a plant species and not much to see here? Well, you know, that's one of the big questions, not a great answer. I don't have a great answer for it, but we can speculate that one, fungi, uh, mushrooms are ephemeral, so they're not like a plant where you can predict where they'll be. They don't overwinter clearly as like, you know, a, a leafless bush or something. So to even find the same one year to year, predict it is actually quite hard. Um, you get some consistency, certain patches with like mushrooms, but a lot of the molds, a lot of the fungi that do some of the most important work for the environment are in the soil inside of plants. And so you don't even see them. So without microscopes and modern technology, we never even knew that they were there. Um, and then that's where some of the most ecological benefit comes. And so historically you had traditional people, you know, for thousands of years, picking mushrooms, different cultures did that a lot. A, a lot of cultures avoided them for any number of reasons, superstition, the fear of death or the association with decay, 
is often a common excuse. Um, and I think there's a lot of discussion around the question of why a given culture had what we call mycophobia, a fear of fungi, and why others didn't. I think it's actually a really interesting sociological question, anthropological question. Um, but in the West, you know, we, if we were thinking about Western culture as an easy inroad, um, at some point along the way, fungi were sort of just pushed out of conversation. The, the traditional knowledge of people, traditional peoples and traditional European cultures and things was formalized and written down about 250 years ago um, by Linnaeus and some of our famous early biologists. And that sort of codified this study of mushrooms and naming them and sorting them out, that kind of thing, traditional mycology, we call it. Um, and it kind of just stayed in that arena for about 200 years. And you only had a handful of players in the West furthering and reclassifying and detailing and naming new ones and things. In the East, you had a lot of traditional use of mushrooms and being that being refined in like Chinese medicine. But because of the lack of cultural exchange and, and their knowledge base to some degree, you know, we didn't catch up on that till more recently. So again, in the West, it, it just sort of as the science was looking at, you know, we got to name some stuff, but by and large is, especially you say, our Western European culture developed they, that fear and that disassociation with decay and morbidity um, arguably is one of the reasons they were kind of pushed out. You know, it doesn't make, it's an easy thing to say, you know, but any scientist, anybody, I mean, you see the benefit of growing plants out of soil, where does soil come from, it's decay. So it's not really clear how, who started that, like, let's not look at these things because they're associated with decay. You know, um, it's just, it's not a, it's an easy out, but not a great one for me. Uh, but regardless, it's somehow that kind of got formalized or sort of placed into our Western culture where most kids are taught, you know, don't even look at them, let alone touch them. Uh, we don't learn how to identify them. Um, you know, there's a lot more deadly poisonous plants in the world than there are deadly poisonous mushrooms. Hmm. And a lot of plants can make you sick and all kinds of stuff. And a lot of plants look very similar, of course, but we don't have the similar fear ingrained in us. So, you know, a lot of interesting questions, a lot of taboos to sort of try to shake off is what I've tried to do over the years um, through showing how interesting and cool and weird and, you know, beautiful and important fungi are and just try to change our languaging and thinking about them. Um, and, you know, other, people's have, other people have tried. Um, of course, the cultural revolution of the mid 20th century and the reintroduction of especially psychedelic mushrooms brought a new perspective on them and a different type of appreciation. But that only resonated with, you know, a certain aspect of society and also sort of almost pushed probably a lot of the other parts of society away from mushrooms because of those sort of associations there. So you had this sort of, you know, it's good and bad that that happened. Um, but again, we just kind of move forward through time and really it's thanks to the internet, better technology, DNA stuff, whatever, um, you know, uh, thankfully a handful of scientists were able to push some of our findings forward and promote them. And then Ted talks and things like this, um, the ball starts rolling. And then you get a bunch of people that are excited, early adopters, uh, such as myself, my peers, lots of people on Facebook and YouTube and just starting to talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. And when I was young, I was on the fringe. None of my friends got it. You know, I was kind of just going, saying what I thought and nobody really got it, but I didn't care. And now, you know, just more people did that. But thankfully, it didn't drop off the boat kind of thing. I suppose like um, in the West, at least, we've had quite a sort of, we've had, uh, we've moved from sort of one dominant homogenous culture to another over the past two and a half thousand years, whether it be the Romans or, uh, or right the way through to the British Empire. And when you have such a dominant uh culture over it that holds so much power it's easy for that culture to uh, make certain practices taboo then isn't it whereas i guess indigenous populations and maybe populations more to the east there is more sort of uh there's, there's less there was less statism less hom homogeneity and that means that these sort of uh the lessons, the, the the wisdom that's been transmitted through through generations can be maintained easier, whereas it would be outlawed, you know, in, in certain times in the West. Yeah, I mean, you, you do have in a lot of, you know, even France and Italy and a lot of Eastern European countries still traditions of mushroom foraging, and it is a big part of uh, family traditions there, just go out to the woods. Maybe they, maybe the family only knows one or two species, and it's the one that they learned from their grandparents, and it's... Right really niche to the local cuisine, but there is that tradition of going out and picking mushrooms and it's not as unfamiliar as maybe many people in the United Kingdom or many people in the United States and North America. Um, just the act of doing that, even if you only know one or two. Um, so I definitely, it, I definitely know, get that vibe that it's, it's seen as dangerous in this country. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say is like um, mushrooms kind of growing up as a child, you're kind of told to stay away from them in case you get one that's makes you <clears throat> ill basically and like you just said you know 
Um, there's well, to be fair, there's like at the moment there's giant there's giant posters near where I live about um, uh, giant hogweed um, and things yeah. like that. You know, that can sim- have a similar kind of reaction, I guess, to certain types of mushrooms and stuff. Um, so it is that kind of messaging, I suppose, isn't it? In the different and the other context, it's it's used viewed within this country as psychedelics, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of viewed inappropriately from the kind of stuff that I've been looking at recently. Definitely, anyway. Well, it's, I think it's still a Class A drug, isn't it, in the UK? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's on a par with uh, heroin. What else? MDMA? Yeah, cocaine. Yeah, if I it's think. cocaine. Dr- dried and prepared, it becomes Class A. I think if it's... Um, it's so weird yeah, that something that just springs up from the ground... Mm. Is, is, is perfectly legal until you pick it and then dry it and all of a sudden, I mean, I don't know what the uh, the punishment would be for possession of a Class A drug, but Mm-mm. it's quite bizarre, isn't it, how yeah. something so natural can be um, terribly illegal. Yeah, bit of a weird one, isn't it, really? I mean, when I was kind of, I think when I when I first messaged you, I said I'd, I'd read um, Entangled Life by Merlin uh, uh, Sheldrake, um, and what struck me when I was beginning to read that was, and he kind of talked about it a little bit, was how central um, fungi are, and the, certainly sort of like mycelium networks and things like that, to um, most kind of plant growth on the earth, to be honest with you, from kind of what I was reading. And I found that quite surprising because from my kind of perspective, I, I sort of, uh, well, certainly in this country at the moment, it's quite a big thing. And there's because I'm just going to say this because there's, um, there's a giant ash tree in in my back garden or near to my back garden and there's something called ash dieback which is caused by a fungi as far as i'm aware and loads of trees are being cut down in the local area because of that but basically what i was getting at is that it's always has it's always has this kind of negative connotation when you're talking about fungi rather than sort of all the good that it does in terms of these like symbiotic relationships it has with various plants i thought that was quite amazing really and something i was completely unaware of yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, a, gr- a great point. And it's one of the things that, um, you know, depending on the context, I'll, I'll point out as well that if you learn anything about mycology in informal education, uh, very often, you know, I've met people who got a four year degree in environmental sciences or environmental design or something, and they maybe got no, no exaggeration, one day of, of fungi or maybe two or something. Mm-hmm. And it's just focusing on the pathogens. And that's kind of all that fungi do. And mm-hmm. that's really a lot of the paradigm when they're, when they're thinking about environmental assessments. And it just speaks to, you know, the, the, the slow pace at which, at which science updates itself and which um, textbooks are updated. Often you have to wait for one generation of professor to be replaced by the next. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lag. There can be multi-decade lag of awareness. And that's, you know, one of the things where you have to be self-taught or look outside the box for lots of topics, um, but especially with mycology to get the most current information. Um, you know, in writing my book, it was... Uh, I'm, primarily self-taught and it was just reading lots of peer-reviewed papers because most of the stuff isn't translated for the lay person and it's just kind of having that devotion to it to translate it to the next person um, so they can benefit from what we're finding and because again the textbooks aren't really keeping up to pace and so that's what most people learn in you know almost any science um, you know if you get any 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 integration of mycology into it whether it's a human uh, social science a natural science a hard science um, it's very limited kind of across the board, no matter the topic and probably very often, if anything, looking at the negative impacts of fungi on economy, on health of animals, plants, and which ultimately kind of translates to economy, you know, and back to the money, um, rather than what we're always trying to shift towards now in, in the work that like Merlin's doing and other people is highlighting all the great benefits they do, which vastly outnumber these supposed negative drawbacks. And, in many ways, what you're describing and, and some of these ecological impacts of these pathogenic fungi, I think can, depending on the context, um, you know, can really often readily be reframed as a lesson into the health of the environment. It's not really the fungus causing the problem. The fungus is actually providing a service to clear out, you know, an unhealthy space. So maybe all these trees, the soil has just been depleted for so long, the trees are just stressed and they can no longer survive. And so the fungus comes in and does what it does to reset the cycle and create new wave of succession. We see this in the forest where one of the most uh, virulent and sort of aggressive and well-known, well-studied mushrooms that attacks uh, many types of trees called the honey mushroom 
it um, has been studied for hundreds of years. It'll attack old orchards and they've tried everything for so long to figure out how to kill off uh, honey mushrooms and it just can't, it's so strong. And, but in the forest, you don't see, it's, it's kind of everywhere um, in many places, but it's not like causing a tidal wave of death of every tree. It selectively thins and it picks off the ones that maybe got struck by lightning or are diseased from some other reason. Wow. It's, it's cr cultivating and crafting the environment and opening up canopy, um, creating hollow snags and, and, and habitat for animals. Um, and again, sort of turning over the tree to create a mother tree that the new generation can come out of. And this is, a lot of this is guided by these, these aggressive fungi. I like to call them, you know, for lack of a better name, I, I try to coin for my book, the vocal fungi, like they're, they're yelling at us. They're telling us something about the environment and speaking really clearly, whereas a lot of the other fungi are more subtle and we don't see them and they're doing great work um, sort of behind the scenes. These ones are a lot more prevalent or present um, and showing us something, you know, there's a lesson to learn. I think I, I hypothesize, and there's some, some records of this with uh, Native Americans and First Nations that they actually learned how to sculpt and maintain their, their habitats and landscapes um, through observing the the actions of of mushrooms in the wild and where they grew and how they just how they how the mushrooms disturb the environment and then they would try to recreate that as a wow. lesson and I think it's something we can try to adopt. Do you think um, <clears throat> Do you think this is a result of us relying so heavily on monocultures and that that's why uh, these certain mushrooms can go pathogenic because we we don't you know. <laughs> We're we're farming with the with 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 the almighty dollar in view rather than sort of uh, from a holistic approach. Yeah, I mean, when you look at a natural environment, a natural habitat, there's diversity, right? And it's not just diversity of plants, but diversity of microorganisms, diversity of fungi, diversity of fungi in the soil, which are incredibly important. It's a you know, topic we can go into, but those fungi, you know, in short, they move the nutrients around. Um, they put the nutrients where they need to be. They feed the plants properly in, in some sense. And they also transform the nutrients and, and do a lot of amazing chemistry. And then even inside of the plants, living throughout the entire tissue of all plants, we believe are, you know, a given tree could have a trillion different fungi living inside of it. And those fungi are shared between plants uh, through the wind, spores are released or insects might bite a leaf fly over to another plant, bite that leaf and kind of transmit a fungus. And then that fungus enters the plant, provides benefit there, we're finding. Um, and so there's there's exchange, horizontal exchange of all these beneficial internal fungi, likely adding to the resilience of, of plants, helping them maybe push evolution, if you will, or something like this, adaptation rather. Um, and maybe this is why I say like a tree that's otherwise very healthy has one really nasty branch. Maybe that one branch just didn't get a right blend of fungi or something is a, is a, is a concept. So when you have monoculture, you deplete the soil, destroy all these soil organisms, all the organisms, the whole soil food web, you rip up all the mycelial networks, the plant can't feed itself because it depends on these organisms to be fed. It's how they've evolved. So if to pour chemicals, pour nutrients, feed them, cater to them, a lot of those nutrients are wasted and toxic or poison the soil, salt it up. And at the same time, you're not even getting these, this exchange, this sort of a genetic updating, if you will, and adaptation that's provided through the movement of these internal fungi. Um, and so that's, and that's just, you know, one way to look at it as well. And you, and you don't have the right stressors where in a, in a habitat, you know, you never walk into the same forest twice because there's always change. There's always something dying and something new growing. And if you're just pushing the same thing over and over again, I mean, it's just, of course, completely unnatural. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why I think these fungi, they, when things are just not working, they hit a sort of peak breaking point. They come in and do this job. They, be, they become the root rot. They attack the old orchard that was fine for 100 years. And now finally, after 150 years, the, the apples are just too weak. Apple trees are too weak. And so the, the honey mushroom takes over and they just don't, and the orchard just don't understand why, because it's been fine for 150 years. But maybe the soil has, you know, something's changed there. Who knows? You know, it's lots of, lots of variables. And so, um, you know, a big part of holistic agriculture and, and going um, away from monoculture systems is just thinking about diversity, not just of plant species, but also of soil organisms and I think these fungi as well. Yeah, the relationship between the fungi and the tree, it kind of sounds similar to me to the re the relationship with between a human and the bacteria that yeah. form a lot of us up, that are on our skin, our gut biome. Yeah. And, you know, you, 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 there's a huge push for probiotics, hasn't there? Hasn't there been over the mm. last few years? So you want to keep the your bacteria healthy because... Oh, there's all sorts of weird science going on about what the gut bacteria can do for you or Linked not. Linked to depression and anxiety yeah. as well. Yeah, so. exactly. And it sounds similar to what's happening with the fungi and the tree. Mm, definitely. Similar yeah. sort of relationship. Mm. 
Um, well, I was going to ask you, you mentioned spores before. Um, I, I'm, I don't know anything about any of this stuff, but do, do fungi use the same sort of mechanisms as trees and plants, like insect pollination or wind pollination, or is it, do they use different mechanisms? Uh, well, yeah, so spore dispersal um, takes a few different forms depending on the species. So say mushrooms, a lot of them that have formed above ground, they they drop their spores, kind of it drifts off um, microscopic structures, hits the wind, maybe travels a foot or two, maybe catches a breeze and travels around the world. Um, maybe it catches on some fur or feathers and travels that way. Uh, but most spores don't go very far from the parent mushroom uh, for those types of species. You have a below ground uh, truffles and other underground fungi that rely on insects and animals and small mammals to eat them and then pass their spores and move them that way. Um, you know, you have like molds that, you know, are familiar to us and they, you know, you just touch a mold and then the spores dust off like that. So it's not as an active um, ejection, maybe it's waiting for more to be sort of tapped. You have mushrooms that sort of have similar functions. They, some of them need to have like a raindrop enter them and it's sort of the, the force of that raindrop pushes out the spores. Um, <laughs> Wild. Yeah, so there's, there's there's some pretty interesting mechanisms in that way. Um, and yeah, fungal reproduction strategies, fungal sex is incredibly complex. So it's not, you know, with animals, it's pretty similar across the board, you know, generally speaking. Um, well, obviously with some variants, but across the board <laughs> with mammals, with mammals, you know, there's like the two sexes and it's more or less works the same. Uh, with fungi, there's an incredible amount of diversity in how they reproduce, not only spread their spores and, and release them, but even how the spores are created. And um, yeah, it's, it's a, another massive area of study. Mostly we've looked at the cultivated mushrooms and like the portobellos and things because their impact on economy. And so we really want to understand every detail there, but it, with 2 million species and only about 2% named, there's, there's a lot we don't know. You're telling me mushrooms have sex? <laughs> they do. Yeah. How, how, of. <laughs> how, does, genetic how does that exchange. work? Genetic <laughs> exchange. <laughs> explain yeah pretend well, that i'm I mean, an idiot <laughs> <laughs> no 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 i mean it's kind of like how you know pollen goes from one plant enters the ovary of the other plant and so it is that that's called plant sex i guess you know it's like genetic <laughs> change um but there's not genitalia exactly uh -huh. so with spores with fungi there's not there's not genitalia with the, the the common example the easy one um is looking at just your average mushroom like your portobello or shiitake and all these spores are released um the, there are two chromosomes that are needed to um, signal that they're genetically able to, to mate. And when the spores uh, land, they'll germinate, they'll start to grow their own little mycelial network, and they're looking for a genetic partner. And they find that partner by releasing and scenting for pheromones that are very similar to the pheromones we use as animals to find a mate. Wow. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a chemical signaling. And when they find the right one, they will fuse their their uh, mycelium together and become, so the two networks become one. And then there's genetic exchange that goes on there. Um, unlike animals, you know, humans where the sperm enters the egg and the two nuclei become one almost instantly. Um, with like mushrooms, the two mycelium fuse together, but you'll have two nuclei pretty much indefinitely for the, for the vast majority of the life of the mushroom. So it sort of has like two brains is the way to think about, it, which is very different than other. It's one of the ways it distinguishes some fungi from others is this uh, extended to nuclear stage. Um, right. Yeah, but there's no genitalia. It's all, no, it's all no. chemical, <laughs> chemical based. Can, yeah. can different species of fungi interbreed? So that's where it gets kind of interesting when you get into the more nitty gritty with it. So just like with animals, I mean, that's how we define a species is they're not able, you know, that's one of the definitions. Biolog the definition of a biological species is a little bit loose or there's different definitions. One of them being that you know, it can breed with other ones like itself. And then if it can't breed and produce a viable offspring, it's, it's a different species. With fungi, that's, that more or less holds true. Um, there is one category of fungi that I find the most fascinating. They're called um, the glomeromycota. There's about 300 of them that we've named. They don't produce mushrooms. They live in the soil. They're super ancient. Um, they form root associations with about 90 plus percent of plants in the world. Do a lot of the, they're arguably the most ecologically significant for all this stuff they do in the soil. And really, if anything came from outer space or if anything is weird about fungi, it's this group because among many things, um, they can do what you just suggested. Two different supposed species can fuse together uh, for a short time, share a bunch of genetics and then break apart. 
Uh, beyond that, what's really interesting is that they not only have one type of nucleus, which you and I and almost every other you know plant and animal only has one type of nucleus, one genetic you know sequence, if you will. These things can have anywhere from 800 to 35,000 genetically distinct nuclei in their body. So they're kind of like a, a the genetic database of the soil, and they've accumulated it likely throughout history. And when they fuse together, they're somehow sharing that. It's a lot we don't understand. It's totally bizarre. And it's argued, it, it's been argued that they this is so unlike all other life, fungi or otherwise, that this category of, of what we call fungi should actually be its own completely separate group on the whole tree of life because of this genetic craziness. Um, so they're super cool, super weird, and, and really fascinating and really important for the soil. Peter, Paul. am I right in thinking that um, some of these mycelium underneath the, the soil or whatever can, can be absolutely massive? And, and you have one group of mushrooms that might pop up somewhere, and then another group of similar mushrooms might pop up miles and miles and miles away. And technically, it's the same, the same organism that's producing those. Exactly. Yeah, we have the largest living organism in the world is in the state where I live, Oregon, just a few hours away. And it's a massive mycelial network of the honey mushroom, this 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 sort of pathogenic one I was discussing. It's in the one of our state forests and they've mapped it genetically. And it's it's a huge area. It's roughly I forget how many acres or hectares, but it's kind of roughly 25. I think it's about 2,500 acres, if I remember correctly. And it's anywhere we don't even quite know, 2,000 to 9,000 years old. It's kind of hard to age. Um, mycelium, mycelium can grow indefinitely given enough space and resources. It has no limit on time and space. Um, so pretty cool in that way, I guess. Wow. So that, um, so did that start off as one individual and then over 2000 or 9,000 started as two years, spores and then it's expanded and it's at either end of this network, it's genetically the same. Yep. Yep. Fucking hell. <laughs> it's wild, isn't it? Yeah. It's super nice. wild. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's why i'm into it you know <laughs> yeah one of the questions i was going to ask you was um if you think that they are native to planet earth the whole panspermia mm. well yes yeah, so, i mean you know there's um i talk about this in my book a bit i got pretty geeked on fungal evolution and just looking at the origins of life as a part of all that and there's a lot of stuff we don't talk about in evolutionary theory as it relates to fungi and so this was a, a big curious question for me that i found a lot of um hypotheticals i throw out there one of them is, you know, the big question is where did life come from? The eternal debate about the um, spontaneous, you know, creation of a cell um, is somewhat still debated, you know, and it's the the odds they say are genetically, you know, genetic odds of that happening are so beyond probability. So then there's this argument, well, then maybe life was seeded, um, but then you have this sort of circular argument, where did that seed of life come from? <laughs> you know, on an asteroid, where'd that come from? Um, so apart from like intelligent design or anything like that, we can we can think that, okay, if we take the accepted theory that life spontaneously arose as bacteria and um, move forward, we think that eventually the cells got larger, started to eat the old dead bacteria that were just piling up. And what I talk about in my book is that the first larger cell, more complex organism to do that was something like a fungus, if not what we now call a fungus. So fungi were the first complex celled organisms of Earth. And we as animals and plants evolved from fungi. They're our oldest ancestors in that way. Did it come from outer space? Well, what's quite interesting is that they have studied what organisms can survive the uh, conditions of outer space. You know, on outside the uh, space stations and things like that, so they throw on kinds of organisms, see what they survive if they survive after two weeks in in the vacuum, bring them back in. And many molds, fungi, spores, and especially lichens can survive outer space. And what's interesting about lichens is they are they're a symbiotic community. They're like a micro greenhouse where the mycelium is about ninety five percent of the structure. And it provides a house for algae or cyanobacteria photosynthesizing cells, but also many viruses, many other fungi, bacteria, and even little microscopic um, organisms called water bears or tardigrades. And tardigrades are also, if you've ever heard of them, if you look them up, they're also one of the most alien things on the earth. But they're, they're <laughs> microscopic. And so the argument, and they can survive outer space. They've tested tardigrades and they can totally shut down. They go into this crazy uh, uh, suspended animation seemingly for indefinite periods of time. So the, 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 w the way I would like to think about it, it's not so much that a spore or a mushroom landed, but maybe a, a lichen, because it's like the seed of everything. It has plants, animals, fungi, viruses, bacteria, even little animals um, <laughs> all inside. And, it's, and they not only can survive the conditions of outer space, but they've simulated asteroid impacts and many lichens and fungi can survive simulated asteroid impacts. Oh so, you know, who knows that the whole notion of life being 
uh, brought to earth is called panspermia. Mm -hmm. um, I like to call it pansporia. <laughs> um, twist, but um, ultimately we'll never know, right? No, I guess we hint in there that the sort of um, ev evolutionary science is, is, is doing a good job on sort of plants and trees and tracing things back and trying to sort of find the common ancestors for different things, whereas we're sort of running a bit behind where it comes to mycology. It's sort of, again, like we said earlier on, it's sort of been put to one side for the time being. We don't really understand it and we're waiting for technology to catch up really to be able to analyse these things better. Yeah, I mean, again, without going too deep into the evolutionary thing, you know, the way I look at it, if you if you really line up the the accepted sort of theories and papers, and I provide lots of citations to to make these claims, is that the way I see it, or what makes the most sense to me based on what other researchers have done, is bacteria started everything. They piled up for about a billion years, and then something evolved to start to eat those dead bacterial cells. That was probably a fungus or something like a fungus. The fungi traveled across the early rocky earth and eventually teamed up with um, plant cells. And those plant cells probably de developed by a fungal cell eating a photosynthesizing bacterial cell, just like the mitochondria in our cells was created in a similar way where a larger okay. cell ate a bacteria. And then we caught mitochondria, which creates right. our cellular energy. Yep. I think now that it was debated for a long time, but now they more or less accept that that's the same thing that happened with plants where a photosynthesizing cell became the chlorophyll generator in a plant cell. And so what was that thing that swallowed that thing? I think it was an early fungus or fun something like it. Yeah. So fungi sort of created plant cells, if you will. And then the some of the chemical structures changed over time, the cell walls, but they're actually very similar. If you want to get even more into the details of fungal cell walls and plant cell walls. Then so plants start to evolve, algae and things. And then the earliest structured organisms of Earth were lichens from about 600 million years ago. And they form on the shores. And just as today, we have many lichens covering rocks. And those early lichens were covering the rocky Earth, which was all there was and dissolving that rock with acids produced by the fungi and then the plant matter decomposing, building up the first soils of earth and they travel across the entire lithosphere and pave the way for eventually more plant evolution. And just to sort of end this long topic, um, the earliest plants have fungi living inside them and the first plants with roots have fungi on those roots uh, providing nutrients. So they've been there at every, every step of the way, you know, in my mind, kind of shaping, guiding evolution. Well, in the way that you describe sort of bacteria using fungi to evolve to the next step, in a weird sort of twist of fate, do you think that then a few billion years later, the early hominids used the fungi again to, to help us evolve into Homo sapiens? I mean, the argument maybe you're referring to the notion of taking of early hominids taking psychoactive fungi and sort of sparking growth in the brain um, I'm one of the the outliers thinking that that hypothesis doesn't hold a lot of water. Um, and I come at that kind of based on other people's research and argumentation that I think is a little bit more science rooted than the cool idea that that happened. Yeah. Um, we, we talk about it because the leap from, you know, our previous ancestor to Homo sapiens sapiens was so short, it sort of defies evolutionary theory. And that's the whole thing about the missing, the missing link in the evolution chain is we can't really explain the short such an incredible change in our brain uh, skull shape and all kinds of physiological changes in a very short amount of time. And so they've tried to come up with lots of ideas around why that, why that is. And, you know, one of them is maybe the mushrooms did it, if not with that leap or that change, you know, one of the earlier shifts, I don't know. But regardless, um, you know, the, in as much as certainly fungi could have done all kinds of stuff to make humans think differently, it boils down to the simple fact that psilocybin, these, these, these compounds don't actually cause genetic changes, don't cause genetic mutations which is the underlying uh, argument for evolution, true evolution and, and things. So, you know, then it's, you can try to be like, well, maybe it led to a cascade of chemical reactions and who knows, you know, but there's just no direct proof of that other than it's an interesting idea. There's also lots of other things around the, the origin of that idea that say the mushroom eating tribes or, or clans of hominids procreated more or even had better um, peripheral vision. That's actually been, both those theories have been fairly discredited. So it kind of, you know, again, there's not a lot that holds water. And even if you want to go down that route, you sort of have to take all these little arguments together for it to work. And a lot of them don't really hold up on their own. So, you know, it's one of the bubbles I often burst, or at least try to bring a different, <laughs> you know, counter argument to devil's advocate, try to look at the science a little bit clearer. Um, but it's not to say that these mushrooms don't do something, right? The psychoactive ones, if we're talking about those, um, to spark to spark something and, you know, thinking creative, creative outlets and stuff. Peter, more in general, you know, a, with uh, mushroom yeah. consumption, 
Um, I mean, I I hate mushrooms, right? <laughs> In terms of, it, uh, uh, of eating them. Is there anything you can say to convince me that there are benefits outside the uh, quote-unquote delicious flavor and texture of mushrooms? <laughs> well, the first thing I would ask is how they're being cooked for you. In my experience, most places, restaurants and things, the way they cook them, I don't like them. No, um, I, think, I think it would have been a... Uh, part of a, an english breakfast in my very early development <laughs> that caused it probably really wet revulsion. probably really wet and slimy and yeah. um probably just creminis or white buttons with very little flavor and not a lot of appeal so i don't like portobellos i don't like creminis i don't really i mean they're okay but i would never choose them really um but even like oysters or something that are pretty common in the grocery stores here i'm not sure about over there if you have a lot of diversity in your grocery stores with cultivated mushrooms but um, even shiitake, you know, maybe that's even more accessible or something mm -hmm. for me. And a lot of people have shown this to, you really got to cook them, um, a lot to make them in my opinion, much more flavorful. And what that means in short is just dry saute them on a low medium heat, cook out a ton of water. Cause they have a ton of water in them mm -hmm. and that concentrates the flavor. So it's not some watery and slippery and things, but, and also at the same time, if you don't like, the, I don't like the slippery texture personally. So it makes it more sort of dense and chewy. So more like meat in a way. Um, and then once all that steam has come out and that can take a while, like there's a lot of water, most restaurants, I don't think they have the time to cook all that water out. Mm. Um, and then you add some oil or whatnot, and then actually kind of fry it, maybe as crispy as you like salt, um, and whatever little flavoring. And really it's a, a game changer. You know, some people like well, tamari or some, something to uh, emphasize the umami. And right. it's really, it's, it's for me, it's a lot to get the water out and get the texture more dense. And yeah. it's a, it's a night, night day experience. Crispy might do it for me. I'm, I'm going to try that. Definitely. Uh, are there any sort of, um, speaking of the, the early man and, um, and the consumption of the mushrooms, were there any benefits to having mushrooms in the diet at that time? And how did they know? I guess it's a case of how do we know anything? We just pick it, we eat it, we pick it, we smoke it, whatever we, <laughs> we, you know, we found out through trial and error over thousands and thousands of years. Right. But yeah, I mean, of course. And so, you know, and that, that's why we can argue that some traditional cultures, maybe early on, they figured out that some mushrooms are deadly and they just avoided all of them. You know, it's hard to say. And then different myths might have popped up around uh, around mushrooms in different cultures. Um, our oldest example, our oldest known proof of human consumption, intentional human consumption of mushrooms comes from almost 19,000 years ago when uh, from a cave in northwestern Spain where wow. a woman figure a woman figure who seems to have been probably a high member of society, a sort of a royalty class, elite class, was ceremonially buried in a cave um, as a part of a nomadic culture known as the Magdalenian culture. And she was yeah, buried with flowers and painted in this red uh, ochre paint. So she's called the Red Lady. And on her jaw, she had the spores of two different mushroom species. And we don't know the identification of the species, but I... I, I, I throw out there, you know, it could be anything, but what if it was our very famous red and white mushroom, which if we want to get into psychoactive mushrooms and culturally significant mushrooms, that is the mushroom that I could, you know, talk in to the end of days about because that one has a way more impact on cultural development, uh, mythology, art, and arguably even the world religions than say our more popular, you know, magic mushrooms of today that have psilocybin. Mm -hmm. the, the red and white mushroom we call the fly agaric. It has different active compounds, totally different experience, totally different mushroom. Um, and, but, you know, maybe she didn't eat that. She could have eaten anything, but what it speaks to is, you know, she was in a high class and they, she ate mushrooms. And so was it only for her class? Did she inherit that knowledge from a, a culture, another 20,000 years prior to that? We don't know, but that's our oldest sort of proof. Um, and it's a theme you find in a lot of different cultures from, from the ancient uh, Romans to the ancient Egyptians, um, to some parts of uh, ancient China where mushrooms in certain species were only for the high class, only for the priests or the pharaohs or for the emperor uh, because they were so revered, whether for their nutritional benefit, but arguably for their medicinal benefit and not necessarily psychoactive, but really the incredible health benefits that we now know they have. They figured out long ago, and some of those mushrooms were so rare that you know the only the emperor deserved those great medicinal benefits. Mushrooms are incredibly nutritious. Um, depending on the species, they might be very high in protein. Sometimes they have all the amino acids, essential amino acids. They might have a good amount of trace minerals, different vitamins, um, good flavor, all kinds of stuff. And they preserve well when you dry them. So any culture that figured that out and figured out at least a handful of species that were common 
and dependable and easy to identify, which there are many that are very easy to identify that are safe and good and kind of like the top of the list for beginners. Mm-hmm. If those, and those pop up all over the temperate world. So, you know, if cultures figure that out, they def- were likely adding them to their uh, diet as they tasted and sampled everything else in the environment. Peter, does, um, does ergot fall under the banner of, of lichen, fungi, mold sort of stuff? Well, it's, 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 so it's called a smut fungus. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's a funny name, but it's, it's actually a more highly evolved class, um, even though it doesn't look as complex as say a mushroom, but it's, um, it, it's, it's sort of, it's in the same broad group as a lot of our more familiar mushrooms, even though it looks very different and it's in it attacks plants in this way and certain grasses. Right. Um, Ergot is uh, definitely to be avoided for intentional consumption. It has a lot of compounds that can cause gangrene and, and leprosy and things like this. So we definitely don't want to mess with it, but also it's well known. And maybe you mentioned it because it was, it has precursors and sort of compounds very similar to um, LSD in it. And so there's, yeah, lot, I was, there's been a lot of research. Here. Well, I was asking because I was going to ask if you checked out Brian Mararescu's book, uh, The Immortality Key, that I think came out last year, the year before. I, don't know if well, I just picked it up, that. actually. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but it was suggested to me. Yeah, yeah. it's it's very interesting down that line of uh, ergot being used in the ancient mystery schools and possibly during ceremonies and at the birth of Christianity and all this. This Again, it's going back to these um, weird organisms being used in a sacred context like they are in South America still today. Yeah, I can't, I can't speak to what he says there. I want to check it oh. out, you know, what I knew, what I had always heard, and I, I really am curious if he has, you know, updated information, but what I'd always heard, one of the arguments against the notion that ergot was used in the uh, mystery schools and practices um, of especially like ancient Greece, really famous, is that uh, we don't, we haven't figured out today a way to safely extract the compounds. And so, you know, even with modern chemistry, we can't figure out a way that they would have traditionally done it in a safe way where and not extract the, the really toxic stuff. So maybe he talks about that. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, there's but, uh, uh, one of our previous guests, Dr. Eric Klein. Oh, Do you yeah. remember the uh, oh, yeah. archaeologist? He's working uh, on a dig called Tel Cabri in Israel, and they found an ancient wine cellar. And uh, Brian Marescu, uh what do you call it when you uh, shout someone out in your book? Name check. Give a shout out. Give a shout out, yeah. <laughs> to Eric Klein, because um, basically they took some of these wine, I don't know if they call them amphories, amphory jars, and sent it off for some sort of chemical testing, and that's where they found traces of uh, psychedelics. And, mm. the, the you know, the theory is, is that it was sort of a, a brewed, mixed wine, that, that it was wine spiked with ergot or potentially other compounds related related. Um, I th- you'll love it anyway. It's a fascinating book. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the LSA that's in ergot is in other plants as well. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'd love it to come from a fungus. That'd be cool. It's just as I, it's always a very cautionary tale about anybody wanting to experiment with ergot in their mm. you know, home kitchen because it's just so dangerous. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, you know, there's, there's, you know, different hypotheses around some of, you know, what the Kaikion was in the Eleusian mysteries of ancient Greece, this, this mysterious brew that Socrates was killed because he shared the recipe about, um, it was so, so coveted. Um, some people think it was an ergot extraction. Some people think it could have been mushrooms or a blend of Syrian rue and all kinds of stuff. It's, there's good speculation, but, um, and we only can really point to some poems and things about Demeter to think that it's ergot, but again, it's, it's a little bit of uh, conjecture and, Interesting conversation for, for sure, though. Yeah. What about yourself personally? Do you do you uh, use these things for psychonautic experiences, or, or are you more th- using it for sort of physical health, or just through scientific perspective, or or what? Um, well, I'm high right now. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> no um, I mean, you know, I'm never shy to say that I've certainly taken psychoactive mushrooms in the past, and it's changed my life and benefited me. Um, I always caveat that with I've also known people who friends who've had really uh, detrimental experiences so I always put a lot of caution around anybody just diving in you know prepared um, despite the the excitement that might surround it or something um, but yeah I've done that I don't do it super regularly you know it's a little bit of a private practice type of thing um, and then generally yeah I mean I certainly take mushrooms um, I make my own medicinal extracts I grow medicinal mushrooms I actually right behind this wall is part of my mushroom farm mm-hmm. um, and so 
we do a lot of work there and um yeah i mean i've taken a lot of them throughout my life i i mean i kind of dabble in a lot of it and then i try to teach a lot of it um sort of as a part of that as i learn and so anything from the foraging to the cultivating to the processing um etc so yeah. why don't you uh, tell us a bit about the website and the book yeah um so you know i, I got into mycology as a teenager as i said and then it was just over you know, 10, 15 years that I was just putting pieces together. I'd hear little tidbits, I'd read books here and there and learn new things. And it was also fascinating. And, you know, I try to convey these tidbits that were stimulating my mind to friends. And eventually as I started to teach uh, through a series of, you know, events, and I started to get out in the world, share what I know, um, you know, I'd share a lot and have some, maybe things I typed up or resources and point people to other people's books. There re really wasn't a go-to um, that condensed it all. And so, uh, handful of years ago, a little over five years ago now, I finally, I published um, sort of the book I always wanted growing up. And it really touches the tips of many, many icebergs I've come across and, and a lot of the skills, a lot of the great ways to work with fungi, a lot of ways to appreciate all they do, um, touching on all these topics we've, we've gotten into much more and just opening up hopefully the reader's eyes to this vast world of not just like the science of cultivation or fungal ecology, but all these things, I mean, I'm interested, like I say, in, in the cultural aspects, um, the questioning, why do we fear them? You know, thinking a little bit more deeply psychologically, um, all the applications, how to make the medicines, how do we build a house in the future out of mycelium? Maybe, you know, what's that look like? So it's a, it's a, it's kind of like a coffee table book, a lot of reference, a lot of how to interwoven with short essays and connecting thoughts and personal perspectives and insights I've gleaned over the years, talking to lots of people and, you know, all the reasons it matters to me, not just this, topical practical reasons but the deeper meanings too you know why does it move me and what does it make me think about you know life and nature and what you know what i'm doing here and things like this as in as much as i want to go so deep in a text in a reference book um and you know along the way of writing that and researching it for a couple of years i learned a lot more than i was able to put into the book and so now i've been translating all a lot all that extra knowledge into um, online courses and so that's what michael logos is so the book is radical mycology and that comes out of my a uh, lot of work I did with many people over the years, kind of trying to build a sort of grassroots philosophy, if you will, a movement. We've done basically our big thing is big events every few years in the States called Radical Mycology Convergences, where we come together around the skills and the ideas and the excitement of, of a modern microculture, as we call it. And that's what that book is sort of revolving around is sort of this philosophy, this feeling, the sentiment that goes beyond the practical. And the school is meant to be sort of another expression of that, a little bit more of my personal uh, it, the growth I've had in, since the book came out five years ago and the knowledge I've gained since then and the practical applications running my own farm and things for the cultivation parts. And yeah, we launched a couple of years ago, you know, surprisingly, almost two years ago, the first classes came out. But then as I was starting to make some changes to was going to make some new ones and got some feedback from students last year, sort of through a big linchpin and everything. Um, but with the silver lining that it the way it panned out, just taking a big pause and restructuring lots of stuff, improving my uh, warehouse space and a lot of the logistics and a lot of the, you know, camera stuff and just figuring out all the uh, things to make all the, the learning modules and what have you better online and ultimately in person once that's more uh, easy to do. So we're very soon, I've been saying this for any of my listeners will know, I've been saying for a very long time, we're going to have a new website very soon. And it's actually uh, every day closer and I'm pretty excited. It's just things take longer than, than you expect. Um, and that'll be once if people are new to my work or if you've followed before, just again, keeping an eye out for uh, whenever you catch this, that new stuff is coming on, on a couple different fronts, ways to get engaged, um, but especially new classes and a whole new presentation. And just really, ultimately, it's a lot of going deeper and just going even more, uh, making it more personal <laughs> experience, both my personal experience and hopefully facilitating, you know, the viewer's personal experience and not just the how to, but, you know, again, what does it all mean? And, and, and why is it exciting and why do we want to do this and share this? Um, so yeah, I'm quite proud of it and sort of the growth we've been having behind the scenes for the last few years. Um, even though we have quite a lot of students from around the world still joining all the time, there's, there's kind of a lot to come. Cool. What, what sort of things will you learn if you, if you go to the course, is it sort of walking you through how to set up your own small grow operation, if you like, and then what to do to expand it, growing different types of mushrooms, yeah. So right now, I mean, you know, right now we have three classes offered and, you know, I'd say that if people want to jump right in, you can take them, but we're going to be offering new versions of them fairly soon. that will be sort of upgraded. So, um, and if you sign up now, you'll get the upgraded version too, when that comes out. So however you want to look at that, 
But um, right now we have basically a total beginner. Like if you kind of just know nothing, you know, you maybe just watch a documentary, you got excited, you just want to wrap your head around it. It's for the total beginner. And each week there's just like a super, you know, a couple skills. For me, it's it's like the most basic stuff, but for a lot of people, it's 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 all rev it's all totally new. So um, just trying to put that out there and get people excited about all these different aspects. Um, so I call that one the mini ways of fungi and just trying to show you how big this world is. And then uh, there's a one that just goes really deep into mushroom identification. And um, really the first few weeks, we don't even talk about mushrooms. It's really about the foundational how and the, how do you wrap your head around this? How do you do it safely? The tools, the language, um, rather, you know, you can't just rush out there and try to identify some. You can figure that out easily on YouTube. What I try to show you is the underlying structure that'll serve you for a lifetime. And really it's like a systematic approach I've developed to being efficient, but also, you know, just, you know, using your time efficiently and really understanding the mushrooms and going as deep as you want. And then we spend the, you know, the, the second two thirds of the course just going through lots of species over 70 species and broad groups. And most of them apply to the vast majority of the, the world. Um, I try to keep it as, as global as I can um, mm -hmm. while enabling you to, no matter where you travel, pick up a local field guide and, and be able to navigate it. Um, so that one's just mushroom fo focus, identification focused. And then the third one is our more intermediate one, which is really kind of technical, much more sciencey, and that's more about fungal ecology. And so that one is just like hard and fast and deep with the peer reviewed and so soil science and all these nitty gritty about all the fun, what fungi are doing, what and where. And so I try to keep it fun and light, but it's just a lot of info. Um, you know, you have a, a year to work through it. Um, but if you want that hard science that you're not going to get in university, um, it's something I'm quite proud of. And I, and I know really isn't available in most places around the world. Um, and if you're interested in the environment, uh, you know, anything based on the environment, permaculture, landscaping, just anything about soil, plants, um, I would like to think you'll, you'll get quite a good bit of insight. And there are some skills that come along with it. It's not just, you know, information, but I try to give you something, something to do with it, some applications. So that's just the starting place. And then um, it all started. We did a, I did a Kickstarter a few years ago, and that's what helped kick this off. And if you look at the Kickstarter, you'll see a number of other courses that are sort of promised and in the wings. Um, those will more or less come out how they were promised. There'll be some little restructuring as I've learned more and thought about this a lot more. Um, but there's a lot more, you know, I kind of also want to get to new ideas, new courses, large and small, short and short and long. Um, so, but we'll be rolling them out sort of, you know, one at a time and pacing them um, and just giving people a, a good chance to, to, to dive in where they want and at, at whatever pace feels good. Just going back to um, the, the sort of dietary stuff. With, mm -hmm. with the mushrooms, I mean, are they are they do they have protein in them? Is it fiber? Is it carbohydrates? You me you mentioned that they had lots of nutrients and and stuff in them, but I mean, what's like? I'm trying to figure out if you could survive just off mushrooms. <laughs> well, you you know, you never want to. You can't really survive off just one thing. Maybe some people say meat, but that might be controversial for some <laughs> listeners. Jordan um, Peterson. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but um. As far as mushrooms go, you know, some species are complete proteins. They have all the essential amino acids. They might not have it in a good ratio, but some have been shown to have all the essential amino acids. Um, mushrooms, like a lot of plants, they accumulate minerals out of what they're growing out of. So depending on what the mushroom is growing out of, it might pull up trace minerals. Some are better at pulling up certain ones than others. So they can be, you know, high in selenium or something like this. Um, some of them do produce vitamins. They don't really produce as much vitamin B, but some even produce vitamin C, K. Um, they're most known or sort of regarded for a, a unique compound. It's one of the things that's unique to fungi in their cell wall. They have a compound that's similar to cholesterol. It's called ergosterol. And when ultraviolet light hits that, it converts into vitamin D2. So you can take fresh or dried mushrooms, put them in the sun for a few hours and pretty dramatically increase their vitamin D content, which <laughs> most anybody in the Northern hemisphere could use. Absolutely. Um, so that's, that's a nice perk. Um, but really with mushrooms in general, you know, fresh or dried, for most people, even if you don't have a sensitive stomach, it's just good not to binge or eat too much at one go. Um, it just often can, you know, depending on your stomach, but that's always a caution. And, and, and if, and even if it's a gourmet mushroom, you know, if you've never had it before, you might only eat a little bit because I've known people that I know one student one time told me he gets headaches or migraines from shiitake. And so, you know, people are, everybody's different. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that's, you know, common. Um, but you just always want to be sensitive or aware of food sensitivities, especially if you are, are, are already um, food sensitive. But um, yeah, I mean, some mushrooms by dry weight have like 30% protein, you know, which is pretty significant. Absolutely. One of the not, ones not that so keeps, what, um, sorry, one of the ones that keeps getting brought up, is it Lion's Bane or Lion's, Lion's Mane? Mane? Lion's yeah. Mane. Lion's Mane. Is that, is that one that has some sort of superior 
chemical makeup or something. Bit of a superfood type yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. So it's, I mean, it's a pretty good uh, nutritious mushroom. The beautiful, the wonderful thing about, apart from portobellos and button mushrooms, is if it's a if it's a gourmet edible, highly cultivated, it's also going to have some degree of of health benefit. Um, so even like shiitake has has been heavily studied, and it's a great um, immune support, and it does many other things for the body. Wow. Lion's mane is um, fairly easy to cultivate and tastes pretty good. A lot of people it says it tastes like crustacean or maybe like crab meat and texture and, and flavor. Um, but it uniquely has compounds that have been argued to be nature's best defense against uh, neurological degeneration and potentially helping oh. with de- various forms of dementia and to some degree sort of neurological damage repair. So these compounds are called hericinones and aranacines. And what they do in the body is stimulate our body's production of a compound nerve growth factor. So it kickstarts our bodies, makes our body you know, a little bit better at producing this compound that helps with nervous system uh, healing. And so um, there's been quite a bit of studies showing that it can help with the regeneration of the insulation around our neurons, the, the myelin, um, and even clearing up plaques associated with dementia in the brain. I'm a, I'm and so lots, lots of research going into trying to synthesize these compounds, of course. Um, but if you or somebody yeah, you, know you can't has, patent a mushroom, can you? Yeah, you need to uh, just change a little molecule there, slap the Pfizer badge on it, and then you quids in. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that one's gaining gaining huge traction because it's you know like reishi is a, is one of the most famous medicinal mushrooms, but it's really bitter. It's woody. You can't eat it for dinner. You make a really bitter tea or some other extract, put it with coffee, um, you know. But it's not as like delicious. Whereas lion's mane is quite good if you cook it right, uh, and you know it has all these health benefits too. What's the best way of preparing it to uh, get the most out of those benefits, Peter, would you say? Well, you know, again, um, I just trying to get the water out. One technique I saw, because a lot of times when you get at the store, sometimes they come in big kind of, they're, they're sort of like pom-poms is another nickname. It's called a pom-pom mushroom. So it's like a big icicle ball with little, uh, we call them hairs or teeth. And um, sometimes they, they're quite large at the store, often kind of small, kind of like a, a rock, you, a palm-sized rock. And, but that's a lot of water, you know, it can be upwards of 90% water in some mushrooms. And so you want to get that out and an easy way to do that. If you don't want to slice it, if you want to kind of keep the whole thing, there's different recipes, of course, but a neat, really easy one is just put on a griddle. And as the water starts to steam out, either use like a really strong spoon or just like another griddle and just straight smash it down and push it down and you rupture the cells, you get all that water out and you kind of just make it a dense patty. um, And then just kind of flip it and grill it till it's crispy and brown and hopefully got most of the water out. Some, if you eat butter, throw some butter on there, whatever your oil and seasoning is. And, um, you know, buen provecho. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. Mm. Yeah, sounds delicious. Are they pretty accessible here in the UK, Lion's Bane? Can you get them at supermarket? Lion's, I keep saying, why do I keep saying Lion's Bane? Well, I've got like uh, next to no knowledge about mushrooms, but I remember one of our friends had a huge, you mentioned it being quite big. Is it, what color is it? Is it white? Why not? It's, it's yeah, white or off white, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, one of our friends oh, might have yeah. had one and yeah, grown it himself. Put it on, didn't he? Yeah, yeah grew it himself. Yeah, but I mean, if, if you're not starting your own mycological mycelium network, can you uh, can you get them at supermarket? Well, this is the thing, isn't it? I think one thing about acce- accessibility is that it's like when I go to the supermarket, all I see are button mushrooms and portobello mushrooms. Um, Can't get anything I, since I, Brexit. Right? Well, yeah, there's that as well, but yeah, there's. Um, there's not a lot of variety out there in terms of what you can get. And I think that's where you're kind of, the other thing that kind of struck me was that kind of open source thing that you have a little bit around like the, the radical mycology and things like that, that you can go and read that information for yourself and uh, get it. So you can actually start growing it yourself really at the end of the day. Um, Cause you know, yeah, if you, I mean, if, yeah, if you're not going to be catered for, um, you might as well do it yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the, really the big points I made in my book that I've, um, that, you know, in my reality, my sort of biased world of mycology, it's, it's everybody knows it kind of thing, but of course the newcomer isn't aware that mushroom growing is just incredibly, it's, you know, it's on par with making good beer, um, or good wine in your kitchen. It's a, it's a fermentation hobby. Ultimately it's a microorganism eating foods you feed it, turning into something else. And just like with other fermentation hobbies, you need to prepare the ingredient, get the right ingredients, prepare, clean some things up, make it nice and tidy, um, and then just follow the steps and, you know, try not to make a mistake. And you will make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You'll have some batches go bad and you learn and then you just get better. Mm -hmm. 
And there are techniques nowadays that you really can do it in the kitchen and you can do it without a big lab and all sterile, which is what I learned when I was a kid. It had to be all just crazy sterile. The book said that and it was so intimidating, but that's what like intrigued me was the challenge. Uh, most people don't have the time or energy to face those kinds of like logistical and you know, infrastructural challenges in their apartment. So a huge breakthrough in the last 10 years, um, you know, it was a game changer for me when it really hit the scene, if you will, a bunch of years ago. And now it's kind of very familiar for lots of lots of folks into it is is techniques that get rid of all of the fancy lab equipment and you can have quite a lot of success growing lion's mane and many others just in your kitchen very low tech but high yield um you know i'm not sure resources in the uk one of the biggest challenges would say like lion's mane uh for the listener is like you know you need to source wood um and a lot of people like in the Midwest of the US where there's not a lot of trees, they use wood pellets, they use like burning stoves. So that's just like, that's one logistical challenge is finding the ingredients. Sometimes it's not as common as like soil that you grow to, you get at a plant nursery. Mushrooms need different stuff. Um, but there are other species that are very easy to grow. Oysters are a great starter for most people. They can grow on coffee grounds. They can grow um, on a lot of like agricultural waste, all kinds of stuff. Wheat straw is really common in the US, but coffee grounds, I mean, anybody can do that in their kitchen and get mushrooms out of it. Um, with very low cost, very low input, and you know some risk. You might get a mold batch, and then you just kind of get over it and try again, and you get better at it. Um, and that's a lot of. That was one of the underlying ethos with the erratic mycology thing is decentralizing and empowering anybody to take on this thing that we we were. You know, I grew up kind of learning vaguely that it's impossible to do, and so it's empowering to do to learn something that you were told you couldn't. Um, let alone all the benefits you get for yourself, your food, your family, may maybe make a living out of it as well. Of course, is it possible to cultivate outdoors? You know, um, if you have like a little herb garden where you've got little patches set aside for growing different herbs, is there like a hardy ma uh, mushroom you can grow outdoors? Yeah. And so, I mean, this is one of the easiest inroads for people that just kind of, you know, don't know where to start, don't know how to start. Um, the go-to outdoor mushroom is what we call the garden giant or the king stropharia or queen stropharia. Um, and the wine cap, burgundy cap has lots of names because it's been grown for so long. It's really kind of came from Eastern European uh, cultures and people figuring out it grew well in the garden and like in the base of the corn where it's shady and moist. Um, but this mushroom, it grows on all kinds of stuff. It does, it like a lot of mushrooms, not all of them, but a lot of them do prefer wood. You might think of like horse manure, that's more for portobellos. Um, a lot of the mushrooms we actually like prefer wood and this one prefers wood, it does quite well on that, but it can also grow on kind of composting materials. It's really uh, flexible and which is makes it really nice. It can tolerate direct sun exposure. It can tolerate drought. Most mushrooms can't. And, and it, and you kind of just throw it in the garden. You, you, what you'll need to do is the, for listeners, find a local provider, whether in the UK or somewhere else in, you know, your part of the world, get it imported uh, garden giants spawn, sawdust spawn, or you'll talk to them, figure out what they offer. Follow the instructions, mix it with some stuff in the, in the garden, just follow the instructions, lots of videos on YouTube about this. And if all goes well, it'll establish, and in, you know, three to six months, you'll get a patch of, you know, dinner plate size mushrooms that taste <laughs> fairly good. Wow. And they're kind of, you know, they kind of hit people's palate a little bit differently. I kind of think of them as sort of like the potato of the mushrooms. They don't have like a strong flavor, they're like a flavor carrier, but you get a bunch of them and they get huge if you want. And they just kind of, and they'll run all over the garden too. You plant it here and then actually next year it shows up all the way over there and you just gotta you just gotta keep feeding it um give it new food every season try to keep it moist if you can yeah but it's a great one to start with yeah. are, are these um are these uh, mushrooms safe for dogs and cats as well um you know as far as i know you know the the only poisonings that we report in the u.s are usually poisonous species that are also poisonous for humans so yeah. Yeah. Um, i'm not yeah so like this one as far as i know is safe for animals if they ate the garden giant you know dog would be fine yeah yeah, pretty sure. Dog eat anything, wouldn't it? So. Yeah, my dog will eat anything. Yeah, <laughs> just eat, you know, I don't want it getting diarrhea or something. No. It's a nightmare. Uh, you mentioned you got the new website coming up. Is there anything, any other new developments coming up on the horizon? Things that you're planning? More books? Yeah. So, so another, um, well, a couple of things. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, this big event I mentioned, the Radical Mycology Convergence. We have been doing it historically every other year. It got postponed last year and we decided to postpone it again this year because of um, just how Oregon's handling COVID and it just kind of seemed it wouldn't be right. We'd like to have a big gathering. And so that'll probably have to be postponed until next year. In lieu of that, we started last year, me and the people I work with and are doing again this year, um, the Fungi Film Fest. So it's the world's first film festival dedicated to fungi. Last year, it was only 10 minutes and less films. Um, and it was great. We had over three hours, three hours of incredible content from around the world. 
And this year we've extended it to all durations. And so we're still taking submissions for the next few days. I don't know when this episode will come out, but that's about to close. But then folks can go to fungifilmfest.com, get tickets uh, soon. They're not available just quite yet, but um, that's great. And then we'll be streaming uh, the program in November online. And that'll be probably pretty fun. A lot of the submissions so far have been pretty amazing. So we're excited again about that. Um, it's just a way to kind of build community culture, push the uh, yeah, cultural development of, of the mycoculture as we call it forward, which is what the convergence is meant to do in its own way. But this is a sort of more globally accessible and in a different form of creative expression. Um, I do have a new book coming out through a company called Microcosm Publishing next year, early next year called the Mycocultural Revolution um, that we haven't been publicizing that. It's just kind of hit their website, you know, if you look for it but that'll be happening. It's a much more introductory book to a lot of what's in my big book, Radical Mycology. So if you just want something super beginner, that's a, that'll be a good starting place. And yeah, and then the, um, like I said, the new courses are coming, you know, as with anything you can follow on social media, we have an email list, that type of thing to just stay up to date. And really once everything's a little bit more lined up, there's kind of last moving parts to get into place. Um, we'll sort of be pulling the trigger and, and trying to move, you know, as quick as possible through all these, these big new uh, changes. Cool, exciting times ahead. Yeah, I'll yeah. Uh, yeah we've come on. Were you going to say something, Matt? No, I was just enjoying you. Okay, <laughs> no, I, I was just going to say we've gone over an hour already. I'm going to have to let Peter go. So uh, yeah, the website's there. If you're watching on YouTube, michaellogos.world, no www's, and the links will all be in the description anyway for uh, your website and uh, sign up to the newsletter and keep up to date. Mm. And yeah. uh, it's last been, thing I'll say. Yeah, go on. Go on. Oh, just one thing I'll say about my book that can kind of be confused for some folks is um, it is available through Amazon, but we charge a bit more because of the fees and stuff. So if you, people in your part of the world want to get a copy, go to the publishing website. Um, it's C-H-T-H-A-E-U-S dot com. It's a made up word. Theus is how you pronounce it. But anyway, there you'll see uh, like UK shipping and European shipping and the total Will definitely be cheaper than if you got it say through amazon or other local retailers it's kind of the best route there but there are some uk distributors now we're working with and things as well excellent sounds mm -hmm. cool well thanks for your time peter it's been uh, fascinating learning about mushrooms i've really yeah, enjoyed this great. one yeah thank yeah. you yeah and uh, don't forget to check all the links out in the in the uh, show notes um should we go i think we should yeah thanks very much peter <laughs> Stay on the line yeah, for us. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, it's great to meet you. Stay on the line for us for a minute while we play ourselves out, and uh, we'll catch you a lot on the flip side. Peace. <laughs>